Heavenly Father, the work that you do in this city and in this work and this church is beyond belief and beyond anything that we can ever ask for. All the hearts that are being changed now, just as the song says, the eyes that are turning towards you, the lips that are beginning to praise you are the works of your hand, and we, we glorify you for that. We praise you for that. Thank you for Tina, for Suzanne, for Peter, for Calvin, for Alice, that all of these five and the Shibugemu team this summer, they witnessed your work in their lives. And we pray that you raise up a generation of people who are radical and who, are, who have a great burden for the ministry and who are willing to die for the gospel. This city is a city that needs more than anything else a community of Christ followers who are willing to lay their lives down for the gospel. And Lord, we pray that for our church and we thank you that this summer we witnessed lives being changed and hearts being turned to hearts of flesh. We praise you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, it's been amazing to see what God has been doing uh, in, in our church with our youth. But we pray that that's not just the work that God is doing in the youth, but also in every single person that's here. And one of our goals as a church who wants to do life together and who wants to... Um, have a new experience of doing life together is we want to understand what, how, and how the Spirit can come and work in us. One of the most devastating things for the Jews was the fact that in the 6th century, their temple was destroyed. And there was no way for them to know what to do after that. Where was God going to be? Where was the Spirit of God going to reside if it's not going to be in the Holy of Holies? And then they rebuilt the temple, and then in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed again. And so the, one of the most confusing things and the thing that they had to cause the Jewish culture to completely rethink their theology was, what do we do when the Spirit of God, when, when, when the temple is now destroyed? Where do we go to worship? Who do we offer sacrifices to? Where is the Spirit of God now? The temple is destroyed. The people are in exi exile. What happens now? And one of the things that is the most remarkable in the New Testament, and what some of the, one of the things that is so, such good news to us, that we have, very little we have a big difficulty to understand because we're not Jewish, is when P Paul says in Corinthians 3 that, don't you know that you are the temple of God and that God's spirit dwells in you? Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? One of the most amazing things for us to realize is that God really did rebuild His temple. God really did send forth His Spirit to come live again in the temple. But that temple is not a temple built with stones or with concrete or with iron. It's a temple that is built with flesh and bone, and it is founded on faith. You are the temple of God. That is one of the most amazing things to know is that the Spirit of God doesn't just come with us, doesn't just help us, but that the Spirit of God actually lives in you. This morning when you woke up and you looked in the mirror and you brushed your teeth and you shaved your face, the Spirit of God was in you while you were doing that. Yesterday night when you were having supper with your family and you were talking with each other, the Spirit of God was in you and among you and in your children. That's an amazing thing to be able to say. And it has nothing to do with how spiritual you are, with whether you've been reading your Bible or not, or whether you've been praying or not. The moment you became a Christian, the moment you called you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, and you said to Him, You are my Lord. The Spirit came into you, and you became the temple of the living God. That's an amazing thing to be able to say. And the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at the Spirit and His gifts. We're going to look at what His work is all about and what these gifts mean for us as a church. 
But before we turn to the text today, I just want to point you to a few things that the Bible says about the Spirit that are just so glorious and that I hope will root you in to understand how amazing it is that the Spirit of God is in you right now. So there are three things that I want to point you to about the Spirit and about the Spirit indwelling in you that are just amazing to know. Number one, the indwelling of the Spirit is the fulfillment of the new covenant that Jesus cut in his blood. You remember two weeks ago when we talked about the new covenant that Jesus cut in his blood? Well, when Jesus said that, he was referring to Jeremiah 31. I'll read it to you. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. When God says that I will put my law within you, when I will write my law on your hearts, how does he do that? And the answer is he does it by the Spirit of God. The moment you became a Christian and you accepted Jesus into your heart, the Holy Spirit began carving onto your heart the commandments of God, one by one, onto the tablets of your heart. This has nothing to do with memorizing Scripture. This has nothing to do with taking Scripture and studying it and putting it in your head. This has everything to do with the Spirit taking the things in in your head about God's commandments, about God's will, taking those things in your mind, and the Spirit takes it and He carves them one by one onto your heart so that you would really know God, so that you would really love His commandments, so that you would really live as a Christian ought to live. That's what has been going on in your life the day since you were baptized. And it's the thing that is going on until the day you will be taken up into the kingdom of God. In Ezekiel chapter 36, it speaks of the same thing. God says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. It wasn't enough for God to just forgive sin. It wasn't enough for God just to give us a second chance at life. God had to put His Spirit inside of us so that we would be empowered to live as people of God. Christianity is not a religion about morality. Christianity is not even a a religion about loving people or about doing good to society. Christianity is about the power to be able to do so because Christianity is about the Spirit of God being in you empowering you to be able to love people, empowering you to, be, to live a holy life. That's what separates us from every other religion. We are called to live as holy people, not by our own power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. You all know what the Bible, the, most of us know what the Bible calls us to do. You know what is right and what is wrong. You know what you have to do in life to glorify God, and you know the things you should be avoiding in life. But Christianity doesn't just tell you those things. Christianity gives you the power to do so. It is the power for you to live the life that God calls you to live. Jesus doesn't leave you as an orphan. Jesus Jesus gives you his spirit that you can live his life. So that's number one. Number two, the indwelling of the spirit is the completion and the perfection of salvation. You know, when Jesus died on the cross and he was raised from the dead, that wasn't the end of salvation. If salvation ended at his death and had ended at his resurrection, then all of that work that Jesus accomplished would still be outside of us. It would still be outside of us. Because the Bible says that anyone who does not have the Spirit of God does not belong to God. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Christ. For us to participate in the work that Jesus accomplished, we need to belong to Christ. We need to be united to Christ. And that can only happen 
when the Spirit comes and unites us to Him. The work of salvation was completed not at the cross, not even at the resurrection, but when Jesus ascended into heaven and He sent the Spirit to come and to live in every one of us. That's when the salvation was completed. When we praise God for saving us, we don't just pray for that, we don't just thank God for dying for us on the cross. We thank God for sending the Spirit into us so that we have a new life. We are many, many, many more times fortunate than Abraham. We are infinitely more close and intimate with God than Moses, who walked and talked and saw God. That's an amazing thing to say, because God lives in you. And Romans 8.15 tells us that this, you received a spirit of adoption by which all of you now can call God, not just Lord, but Father. It is by the spirit of adoption by whom we can cry, Abba, Father. And it is this spirit who bears with our spirit that we are children of God. You know, one of the most amazing things for us to be able to call God is Father. He is more Father to you than your earthly father. Suzanne spoke of her fa earthly father and her love for her father. But you know what? Your earthly father does not compare with your real father in heaven and the father you have become adopted and the family you have been adopted into. The work of salvation was completed when Christ went into heaven and sent us his spirit. And the Bible actually tells us that the spirit could not come onto the earth if Christ had not left the earth. In John 16, 7, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For I do not go, if I do not go away, the helper, the spirit, will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. The Holy Spirit can only come if Jesus had left the earth. And as an individual Christian, the Holy Spirit living in you right now is a steel, is a stamp of God on you saying, you are now my child. You remember when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist? And John the Baptist saw from heaven a dove falling on Jesus. And the Bible tells us it was the Holy Spirit that landed on Jesus. And right at that point, a voice came out of heaven saying, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. You remember that? Well, when you became a Christian, you were baptized into the name of Jesus. What happened was that the Holy Spirit came on you at that very moment. It, the Spirit dwelt in you. And in heaven, all the angels rejoice because God the Father says, You are now my daughter whom I love. You are now my son whom I love. The Spirit of God living in you is the seal of of your sonship and your daughterhood. Much more than that, we've been talking about how we, as the church, as the body of Christ, we're the bride with who, for whom God purchased for his son, right? Remember that? So the Spirit coming on us as a seal and the Spirit coming on us as a guarantee is like the engagement ring a man gives to his fiancée saying, you are now my betrothed. You now belong to me. Every single one of us, when we have the Spirit living in us, it is a seal and an engagement ring promising to us how one day our, our groom, Jesus Christ, will come again and take us into the kingdom. It is a foretaste of what it's going to be like to be with Jesus. So the Spirit living in us is the fulfillment of the new covenant that Jesus cut in his blood. The indwelling of the Spirit is the fulfillment and the perfection of salvation. But there's one more thing, and it's one, it's one of the, most, the things that is most comforting to me. The indwelling Spirit is actually the perfection of the promise of Emmanuel. In Isaiah 7, God promised to the Jews, saying to these Jews, saying, you will have a Messiah, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
And 700 years after that promise, God really did come in the form of Jesus, and Jesus was with them. But you know what? That was the fulfillment of the, of the promise of Emmanuel, but it was only a partial fulfillment of it. The full fulfillment of the promise of Emmanuel, the perfection of that promise came when Jesus actually left his disciples and then sent his spirit to come and live among us. God is no longer just with us. God is now in you. It is several times more amazing than what the, the disciples experienced when Jesus was with them. Jesus is in fact nearer to us now than he was when he was on earth 2,000 years ago when he was walking the streets of Jerusalem. Jesus is nearer to us now and he was closer to us now and he's more intimate with us now than he was when he spoke and he talked and he performed miracles in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. And Jesus did that because it wasn't just enough for him to be, for him to be with us. It wasn't enough for Jesus to be among his people. Jesus wanted more than that. As a husband who wants to be more intimate with his wife than just ha hold hands, so Jesus wanted to be more intimate with his people. He wanted to be in his people. And the only way he could do that was by leaving them. I remember as a youth often saying, why couldn't Jesus be here in person? If, just, if only Jesus were here in person, more people would believe in him. If only Jesus was here in person, I would be able to talk to him and, and ask him all my questions. And whenever I'm hurt, I can go to him for comfort. But you know what? Jesus wanted more than that for us. He wanted to be in you so that he can be comfort when or when, wherever you are. He wanted to be in you so that you can be and talk with him wherever and in whatever situation you are. That's why it's so radical and that's why it's so glorious for us to know that the Spirit of God lives in you. You don't need to go to Jerusalem to worship God. You don't need to go to Israel to have a great sense of God in you because God is in you right now. So let's turn to our text today and see what the Corinthian church was missing about this vision of the Spirit, about this understanding of the Spirit, so that we can learn from their mistake. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 to 11. Let's read it. I'll read it and you can listen carefully. Paul writes, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one says, Jesus is the Lord, except in the Spirit. Verse 4. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of ser services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is, is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Verse 1 says, Now concerning the spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be uninformed. In chapters 12 to 14 of 1 Corinthians, Paul's going to write to a church that knows all about spiritual gifts. The Corinthian church was a gifted church. In, in chapter 1, verse 7, Paul writes, You are not lacking in any spiritual gifts. This was a vibrant church. You would have loved this church. They spoke in tongues. They prophesied. They probably had miracles of healing. But even then, Paul says, You are uninformed about the Spirit because you're missing out on the fullness of of what God wants for the church to experience in the Spirit. 
And most probably what was going on was that this spirit, this church was a church that elevated the gift of speaking in tongues above all other gifts. They were a church that were saying that to speak in tongues is the ultimate and the grandest evidence that you are a Christian. And we know this because in chapter 14, Paul's going to spend an entire chapter dealing with the how to use the, spirit, the, the, uh, the gift of speaking in tongues properly and how to put that gift in its proper place. And this is not a problem just for the Corinthian church. In fact, many congregations now, even in our, in our society, in our 21st century, believe that for a Christian, for, that the mark of a Christian and the mark of the filling of the Holy Spirit is to be able to speak in tongues. Denominations like the Assemblies of God, many of the charismatic churches, they believe that. You can read that on their websites. And the same thing was likely true for the Corinthian church. For them to speak in tongues was a mark of the filling of the Holy Spirit. And Paul says to them, I don't want you to be uninformed. I want to point you to three things that the Corinthian church needed to know about the Holy Spirit and His work and they're the same three things that we need to know this morning. Number one, the primary work of the Spirit is to glorify Christ in His people. The primary work of Christ is to make Christ, uh, sorry, the primary work of the Spirit is to make Christ known amongst His people, is to make Christ famous in His people, is to cause people's hearts to be surrendered to Christ. That's the primary work of the Spirit. Verse 2 and 3. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. No one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Many Christians then and now believe that the mark of someone being filled by the Holy Spirit is to be able to speak in tongues. But Paul, right off the bat, he says to the Corinthian church, it is so much more than that. It is so much more spectacular than to be able to speak in tongues. To be filled by the Spirit means that Jesus becomes your Lord. Jesus becomes your God. Not just a Lord and not just a God. Many of us can admit that Jesus is a God, and many of us admit that Jesus is the Lord. But for someone's life to come into surrender into under Jesus' Lordship, there needs to be a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit that changes you and to, help, and to allow you and to enable you to say, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my God. You know the statements, Jesus is accursed and Jesus is Lord, these were statements that the early persecutors of the church used to test whether someone was a follower of Christ. In fact, Paul used, he probably used these statements. In Acts 26, it records that Jesus, uh, Paul says of himself, he said, I tried to force people to blaspheme. And what people used to do to persecute the church was they would take these people and where they would show him the chains, they would show them the fire, they would show them the dungeon and say, who is Jesus to you? If Jesus is the Lord for you, then you're going into the, into the dungeon to be killed. And if Jesus is accursed for you, then you are set free. And Paul is saying that for someone to be able to stand in front of that kind of persecution where his life is at stake and to be able to say that Jesus is still my Lord, I don't care what you do to my body, that requires a filling of the Holy Spirit and a supernatural work of the Spirit to change this person. In other words, the greatest miracle that you can ever experience in this life is for the Spirit to come and to cause you to believe in Jesus and to become His follower. The greatest miracle in all the universe is for someone's heart to be changed from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh and for that person to be able to say, Jesus is my Lord. Two weeks from now, Juliana, and three weeks from now, several other people will be baptized. 
And when those people enter into the water and they come out of that water, that is the greatest miracle you can ever witness. It is more spectacular than for someone to have a disease healed. It is more spectacular than for someone to come to you and to prophesy your future for you and for that future to come true. It is more spectacular than that because that is the primary work of the Spirit, to glorify Christ in you and for your mouth and your heart to say that Jesus is Lord. I witnessed this when I was in Taiwan. We had a, two old men come into our church, both in their 70s, both with physical illnesses. One had a leg who was so infected that, that the doctor said that only amputation was the solution. And we had another brother who was in his 70s, and he had a constant headache, and this headache was preventing him from being able to sleep. And we prayed over these two brothers, and we prayed that God would heal them miraculously. And, one of the, and amazingly, the brother who had an infection in his leg was healed. The doctors were amazed because they didn't need to perform the amputation. And our church, we were so encouraged by this miracle. And this brother, after having been healed, he praised God, thanking God for this amazing miracle in his life. And he, he was just thanking God. And it, it, all for several weeks in a row, he was praising God for this. But you know what? Very quickly after that miracle, he left the church. And we, we didn't, we, he disappeared and we couldn't find him. And this other man who had a constant headache, who couldn't sleep at night, we prayed the same thing for him, that God would heal him. And God didn't heal him. He kept on having headaches. But God did a much more spectacular work in this man by healing his heart so that when we told him about Jesus' death and his resurrection and about what Jesus did for his life, this man, he heard it and he said, Jesus is great. His sacrifice is so amazing. And he came to Christ, and several months later, he was baptized. And from that experience, I saw that, yes, I ought to pray for the healing of my brother. Yes, I want that brother's leg to be healed, but I want infinitely more for his heart to be healed. I want infinitely more for his soul to be healed, for the illness and the disease of his heart to be healed. Because if his physical illness is going to cause him to bring him to death, physical death, then his spiritual death, uh, sorry, then his spiritual illness and his spiritual Ill, his disease is going to cause him to experience eternal death. Yes, we want cancers to be healed. Yes, we want depression to be lifted. But those things are just a matter of life and death. But the matters of your spirit the state of your heart right now is a matter of eternal life and eternal death. And that is infinitely more important. So the primary work of the Spirit is to glorify Christ in His people, in you. Number two, spiritual gifts are diverse, but they are, they are united. Verse 4 and verse, verse 4 through 6, Paul writes, now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are a varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. The spiritual gifts are diverse in their manifestations, but they are all rooted in one God and in one Spirit and in one Lord. But do you notice what Paul is saying here when he says Spirit, Lord, and God? He's saying Spirit, Jesus, and God are the ones that give you these gifts, and these gifts are diverse. And what Paul is saying here is that the diversity of these gifts is rooted in the diversity of the Trinity. Paul is saying here the reason why there are so many gifts in the church the reason why the Spirit gives so many gifts to the body of Christ is because that kind of diversity reflects the richness and the diversity of the Trinity. We worship and we serve a God who is diverse in His unity. We worship a God who has 
an amazing relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that richness is reflected in His people when the people have a diversity of gifts. There is a diversity of gifts in the church, not just because that's the way we can be more effective in evangelism. The reason why there's such a diversity of gifts in the body of Christ is because that's the way we can reflect the richness of God. And you see now that if a church forbids the gifts or some of the gifts, what they're essentially doing is they're preventing a church from growing and being formed into the likeness and the richness of Christ. If a church says, do not speak in tongues, do not practice miracles of healing, do not do prophecies because those things we're uncomfortable with, we are stunting the growth of the church and we are causing the body of Christ to be stilted, to be shallow in its reflection of God. And one of the things we need to realize is that when we seek for unity as a church, we're not seeking for uniformity. We're seeking for unity in diversity, not unity in uniformity. The last thing we want for Grace Church is for every one of us to have the same gifts. That's the last thing we want. The last thing we, we want for this church is for every one of you to be teachers of the Bible or to be gifted in music or to be gifted in healing or to be gifted in prayer in the spirit, in the tongues. We want to be a body of Christ that reflects the richness of His diversity in the Trinity such that all of the gifts are manifested in us. All of the gifts are being used in this church. Yes, we need to avoid the excesses of the charismatic churches and the churches that say that the gift of tongues is the only, uh, is the only proof of the filling of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we need to avoid that excess. And yes, we need to avoid the excess of these televangelists who use the gift of healing as a means to make hundreds of millions of dollars. We need to avoid those excesses, yes. But we also need to avoid the excesses of an evangelical church who does not use spiritual gifts. Wherever there's an excess in the charismatic churches and in the Pentecostal churches, there is also mirrored in the evangelical churches and, and mirrored excess. Yes, many of the, evangel uh, many of the charismatic churches abuse the gift of the, uh, of the speaking in tongues. But in the same way, the evangelical churches, in their forbidding of the tongues, they abuse the Spirit just the same. So we want to be a balanced and a diverse church because that's the way the Trinity was in the Godhead. Lastly, the spiritual gifts are given to every single believer for one sole purpose, to build up the church. The spiritual gifts are given to every single one of you sitting here today who confess Jesus as the Lord, but it's given to you for one purpose, to build up the church. Verse 7, to each is given you the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Every single one of you here today who confesses Jesus as Lord the Spirit, what He did the moment you became a Christian was He took you and He placed you in the body of Christ and He placed you in a specific part of the body of Christ so that in that part, you would be able to serve the church to your maximum. For some of you, you are the arm of the, of the body of Christ. When you came to Jesus, the Spirit deemed that you were fit to be the arm of Christ and he gave you the gifts that are fit for an arm. There are others of you who are feet of the body of Christ. And when you came to Jesus, when the Spirit came into you, he deemed that you were perfectly formed to be a foot. And he gave you the gifts that feet need to walk and to run. So it makes no sense for someone who is a foot to say to someone who is an arm and say, I want those gifts. God, give me those gifts. I want the gifts that the arm have. It makes no sense for God to, to give you those gifts because those gifts are effective for the arm, but they are not effective for 
the feet. And in fact, God doesn't give it to you because it might actually cause harm. You might have these gifts and become arrogant. You might have these gifts and become boastful. And that's the last thing the body of Christ needs. And so every single one of these gifts is given to the believers for the common good of the body. Therefore, the only purpose of these spiritual gifts is to build up the church. Every single one of you today sitting here, you are a crucial part of how Grace Church grows. You are a crucial ingredient here. It's kind of like a potluck dinner. When we have a potluck dinner, everybody brings a dish so that everyone can be fed. But in the potluck dinner of the body of Christ, the Spirit has already given you the dish that you're going to bring. The Spirit already knows what you need to bring to the table. So for some of you, it's you need to bring what, what the Spirit has given you, and it's, the Spirit has given you T-bone steaks. And so you bring your T-bone steaks to the table. And for others of you, the Spirit has put pliers into your hands. He's given you metal pliers put in your hands. And the last thing you need to do is to say that these pliers have nothing to do with those steaks. That's the last thing you ought to do. And woe to you in the church if you despise the people who have pliers in their hands. Because what the Spirit does is He apportioned it and He planned it so that somebody else would bring lobsters. And you can only eat lobsters when you have pliers. That's how the Spirit works. God designs it so that every person has a specific gift, a specific role in the church, because those specific gifts meet specific needs that no other gift can meet. And one of the things we need to do as a church who wants to do life together is we need to bring our gifts to the table. We need to bring our gifts so that the table and so that the church would be served and the people fed. It should be obvious by now that none of these gifts are talents, are natural talents. None of these gifts are things that you are born with. But all of these gifts are things that you are reborn with. You are not born with spiritual gifts, but you are reborn with spiritual gifts. And the interplay between your natural talents and spiritual gifts is something like this. Let's say, let's say James has a spiritual gift of encouragement. God has placed it in him so that he would be an encouragement to the body of Christ. But in the same vein, he has a musical talent so that he can play the piano really well. And the way those two things work out is that when the spiritual gift of encouragement works through the sp his natural talent of music, when he plays the music, people are encouraged. When he plays for the church, the entire church is edified and built up. I'll give you another example. Let's say Judy has a natural talent for cooking, which she does. And her cooking seems to have nothing to do with the spiritual gifts. But when God calls her to serve the church, God gives her the gift of mercy. And God gives her the gift of generosity. And it may be that God will use that spiritual gift of mercy and generosity through her cooking so that whether she opens a restaurant or whether she cooks for the church, people eat that food and feel the mercy of God in and through her food. That's how the spiritual gifts work with your natural talents. But there's another implication about these gifts. If all of these gifts are meant for the good of the church, if all of these gifts are meant for you to serve the church with, that means that you don't study your way into an experience of the Spirit, okay? You don't study your way into a deeper understanding of the Spirit. You don't even pray your way into a deeper understanding of the Spirit. You serve your way into a deeper experience of the Spirit. If you want to understand what it means to be filled in the Spirit, to be empowered by the Spirit, then begin to serve the church. 
you will not understand it just by studying or just by praying on your own. To experience the Spirit in a new way, you need to bring those gifts to the church and experience what it's like for those gifts to flow through you into the church. What does that, all this mean for us as Grace Church? I know that many of you here today, you confess Jesus as Lord, and the Spirit has placed in you a spectacular gift with which you are to serve the church with. But many of you are not serving the kingdom. Many of you have become Christians, and for one reason or another, the burdens of family, the burdens of work, the busyness of life, the busyness of, of taking care of a business, You've taken those gifts, you've received them, but they lay dormant in your life. And what happens when you don't take those gifts and you bring them to the church is that there is a need in the church that cannot be met until you come and you serve with your gift. There are some of you who need to begin to serve the church and to begin to serve the body of Christ. And there are some of you who need to begin to do that again. Because there might have been a time when you were serving God with your life, but because of family, because of work, because of renovating houses, because of wanting to save up money, for one reason or other, you've stopped serving. And the moment you stop serving God, and the moment you stop serving the church, you stop experiencing the Spirit working through you and working for the church. We want you and I want you to begin to experience Christ and His Spirit anew every single day. And you do that by serving the church. Some of you might be thinking right now, I don't know what gifts I have. I don't know what gifts God has given me. And if the gifts of the Spirit are given for the common good, and if the gifts of the Spirit have the sole purpose of serving the church, then what you need to do is not look at yourself and look at the list of gifts here and say, which gifts apply to me? Do I have the gift of service? Do I have the gift of healing? That's not what you should be doing. What you should be doing is you should be looking at the church and looking at the needs of the church and asking Jesus and asking the Spirit to say, Spirit, I see that there's a need right now in the church would you give me the, wor the gift that is necessary to meet that need? For you to discover your spiritual gifts is not by filling out a survey and finding out which of these gifts apply to you. The way you discover your spiritual gifts is you look at the church and if you notice that there's a need in the church, perhaps you see that the church is messy and the church needs people to go and clean it. Then you ask the Spirit, Spirit, would you come and give me the gift of helping? Would you give me the gift of administration so that I can help this body of Christ be more organized? If you see a church and if you see our church and you are dissatisfied with a certain part of it, you can ask the Spirit to come and to give you that gift so that you would be the person to fill that need. That's how you discover your spiritual gifts. And that's how you experience the Spirit working in you. If we're going to go back to that illustration of the potluck dinner, one of the most effective ways to have a good potluck dinner is to ask the organizer what needs there are for that dinner. Otherwise, everybody brings chips or everybody brings Coke. But for there to be an effective potluck dinner, you ask the leaders, hey, what's missing at this potluck dinner? And that they say it's salad, then you pray to the Spirit and say, Spirit, Give me the gift I need to meet that need. And it's the same with the body of Christ. When you come to this church and you feel that this church is lacking in this part, or this church needs to be more this and that, that's an amazing opportunity for you there and then to say to the Spirit, Spirit, come, I see this need now in this church. Would you come and give me that gift so that I would be able to meet that need? It is the Spirit who decides what gift give and therefore you can ask for that gift I want to close by pointing to Christ 
It's not easy to rely on the Spirit. It's not easy to rely and to live in the Spirit. But you know, one of the most encouraging things to know when we look at Jesus is to know that He was able to build the church and He was able to live a sinless life and He was able to be effective for God and for God's kingdom on earth because He relied on the Spirit. Yes, He was God, but when He came in the form of man, He, set, he emptied Himself of that Godness and in His life on earth, Jesus Christ, every single moment, He lived by the Spirit so that He could glorify God in His life. And if Christ did that, ought we not also live in that way? Let's pray now. Spirit God, we are now bold to pray directly to you. We worship you. We praise you because you are the Spirit of God. You are the Spirit of Christ who lives in us. And Lord, every single one here has been given a gift with which they can come and bless the body of Christ. And Lord, we ask that there would be an unusual moving of the Spirit among us today and in the weeks to come. If there's anyone here today that has not yet received the Spirit, Father, we ask that you would do the miracle that is most spectacular, which is to soften hearts and to open eyes so that Jesus would be confessed as Lord. We thank you for this gift. And we pray that in the weeks to come, there would be an extraordinary outpouring of love and of service in this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you